Today is day four for the Come, Follow Me study for this week, July 3rd through the 9th. Acts 1 through 5. Ye shall be witnesses unto me. Thursday, July 6th, 2023. Acts 3. As recorded in Acts 3 through 6, Luke recounted the continued growth and activity of the church in Jerusalem and offered powerful illustrations of how the Lord's chosen servants led the church through the guidance of the Holy Ghost. When Peter and John healed a man who had been lame from birth, the miracle created an ideal opportunity for them to bear their apostolic testimony of Jesus Christ to an audience of eager listeners. Five thousand men believed in their words. Jewish leaders attempted to silence Peter and the other apostles through threats, imprisonment, and physical beatings. Nevertheless, the apostles defended their testimonies of Jesus by replying, We ought to obey God rather than men. The faith of the apostles and those who followed them invited powerful manifestations of the Holy Ghost, which resulted in the rapid growth of the church. In the temple, Peter and John healed a man lame from birth and taught about the mission of Jesus Christ. They were arrested and taken before the Jewish council. Church members had the spirit of unity and had all things in common. Peter and John were again arrested and an angel delivered them from prison. Peter heals man lame from birth. The lame man was hoping to receive money from those who came to the temple, but the Lord's servants offered him much more. As you read Acts 3, consider how the miracle that followed affected the lame man. Acts 3 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the ninth hour of prayer. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Peter and John went to the temple at the hour of prayer to preach the gospel, not to engage in ritualistic Jewish prayers. As ministers of a new dispensation, they would no longer consider themselves bound by the requirements of the Mosaic dispensation which had ended. Acts 3, 2-5 And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. And Peter and John, fastening their eyes upon him, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Peter and John went to the temple for prayer at the ninth hour, which was nine hours after sunrise. At one of the temple gates they encountered a lame man seeking money. Peter and John fastened their eyes upon him and said, Look on us. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained, Peter said with majestic simplicity, Look on us. That is, exercise your faith in that which we as ministers of Christ are about to do in his name and power. Because the layman exercised faith and looked, he was healed. Acts 3, 6-7 then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. According to these verses, what did the man, lame from birth, expect to receive at the temple that day? What did he receive instead from Peter and John? Though the layman at the gate of the temple was begging for money, Peter gave him something much more valuable. Elder Jeffrey R. Hond of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, while he was serving as Dean of Religious Instruction at Brigham Young University, explained, Peter had no money, but he had riches. Such as he had, included every key to the kingdom of God on earth, priesthood power to raise the dead, faith to strengthen bones and sinews a strong right hand of Christian fellowship. He could not give silver or gold, but he could give that which is always purchased without money and without price, and he gave it. When have you attended a church meeting expecting to receive one thing, but you received something better from the Lord? Acts 3, eight, And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Elder Thomas S. Monson said the stirring words Peter then spoke 
have lifted the hearts of honest believers down through the stream of time, even to this day. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Frequently we conclude the citation at this point and fail to note the next verses. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. He stood and walked and entered with them into the temple. A helping hand had been extended. A broken body had been healed. A precious soul had been lifted toward God. Time passes, circumstances change, conditions vary. Unaltered is the divine command to succor the weak and lift up the hands which hang down and strengthen the feeble knees. Each of us has the charge to be not a doubter but a doer, not a leaner but a lifter. But our complacency tree has many branches, and each spring more buds come into bloom. Often we live side by side, but do not communicate heart to heart. Considering that this man had been lame from birth, his healing was a remarkable miracle. For the man to leap and to walk would have required that his weak and probably disfigured legs suddenly be made to, of strong bones and muscles. Also, since he had been lame from birth, he had likely never walked in his life. To now suddenly be able to do so would require balance and physical skills he had never before learned. President Harold B. Lee used the account of Peter healing the man at the temple gate to illustrate how to lift those around us. After reading Peter's words commanding the man to rise up and walk, President Lee said, Now in my mind's eye I can picture this man, what was in his mind. Doesn't this man know that I have never walked? He commanded me to walk. But the biblical record doesn't end there. Peter just didn't content himself by commanding the man to walk, but he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Will you see that picture now of that noble soul, that chiefest of the apostles, perhaps with his arms around the shoulders of this man and saying, Now, my good man, have courage. I will take a few steps with you. Let's walk together. And I assure you that you can walk, because you have received a blessing by the power and authority that God has given us as men, his servants. Then the man leaped with joy. You can't lift another soul until you are standing on higher ground than he is. You must be sure, if you would rescue the man, that you yourself are setting the example of what you would have him be. You cannot light a fire in another soul unless it is burning in your own soul. Acts 3, 9-10 And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. to give alms look on us silver and gold have I none but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up Thank <laughs> you. 
was the man at the temple blessed differently than he was expecting? How have we seen Heavenly Father's blessings come to us in unexpected ways? Elder Neil A. Anderson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles testified of the Savior's power to heal us. My brothers and sisters, it is my promise to you that increasing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ will bring you added strength and greater hope. For you, the righteous, the healer of our souls, in his time and in his way, will heal you of all your wounds. No injustice, no persecution, no trial, no sadness, no heartache, no suffering, no wound, however deep, however wide, however painful, will be excluded from the comfort, peace, and lasting hope of him whose ar open arms and whose wounded hands will welcome us back into his presence. Why are there times when we do not receive the Savior's healing when and how we desire it? President Russell M. Nelson taught, I recognize that on occasion some of our most frequent prayers may seem to go unanswered. We wonder, why? I know what that feeling. I know the fears and tears of such moments. But I also know that our prayers are never ignored. Our faith is never unappreciated. I know that an all-wise Heavenly Father's perspective is much broader than ours. While we know of our mortal problems and pain, he knows of our immortal progress and potential. If we pray to know his will and submit ourselves to it with patience and courage, heavenly healing can take place in his own way and time. Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, Righteousness and faith certainly are instrumental in healing the sick, deaf, and lame. If such healing accomplishes God's purposes and is in accordance with His will. Thus, even if we have strong faith, many mountains will not be moved, and not all of the sick and infirm will be healed. If all opposition were curtailed, if all maladies were removed, then the primary purposes of the Father's plan would be frustrated. Acts 3, 11 through 16 And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw this, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus whom he delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And this man, through faith in his name, hath been made strong, whom ye see and know, yea, the faith which is in him, hath given him his this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Peter acted in the role given to apostles by divine decree when he declared, We are witnesses of the Savior. That same role and obligation has been given to apostles in our day. Without hesitation, Peter testified to the Jewish leaders that it was not any mortal power that had healed the lame man, Jesus, whom they had delivered up and killed, had healed the man. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles spoke of the Savior's power to heal. Ponder the power of the atonement. Pray to understand how it can heal you. If you have felt impressions to be free of burdens caused by yourself or others, those promptings are an invitation from the Redeemer. Act upon them now. He loves you. He gave his life that you may be free of needless burdens. He will help you do it. I know that he has the power to heal you. Begin now. Age of Restoration begins before Second Coming. Acts three seventeen through 18 And now, brethren, I know that through ignorance ye have done this, as also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath 
so fulfilled. What names and titles for Jesus Christ do you see in these verses? What do each of these names and titles teach about Jesus Christ? How does knowing what these titles mean contribute to having faith in his name? Acts 3.19 Repent ye, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Elder Bruce McConkie said, Not that they should be forgiven and be heirs of salvation, as are those whose sins are washed away by baptism, but after they had have paid the uttermost farthing, they shall rise to some degree of reward in one of the lesser mansions. The prophet Joseph Smith referred to Acts 3, 17-19, and said that Peter was addressing those who had crucified Jesus. Peter did not say to them, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, but he said, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. They could not be baptized for the remission of sins, for they had shed innocent blood. The times of refreshing refers to the millennium, when Jesus Christ will return to the earth. The times of refreshing Peter talked about are when Jesus Christ comes again. After the second coming, the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisical glory. As Peter testified of Christ, he warned the people that they needed to repent and spoke of the times of refreshing that would come. The times of refreshing refers to the millennium when God shall send Jesus Christ again to earth. As Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, this times of refreshing is to take place at the second coming of the Son of Man, in the day when the Lord sends Christ again to earth. If we are to catch the vision of Peter's prophecy, we must know pointedly and specifically what it means by the times of refreshing. It is elsewhere spoken of by Jesus as the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory. It is the day when the earth shall be transfigured, even according to the pattern which was so shown unto mine apostles upon the mount. The Lord says, It is the day when the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisiacal glory. It is the day of the new earth that Isaiah saw, the earth which will prevail when wickedness ceases, when the millennial era is ushered in. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Christ came once and ministered among men, climaxing his ministry with his atoning sacrifice and ascension to his Father. He is to come again a second time in a day of refreshing and renewal to reign personally upon the earth, but he cannot come the second time until an age in the earth's history commences, which has the name the times of restitution, or in other words, he cannot come until the age or period of restoration. And in that age or period, all essential things that God ever gave in any age on the earth for salvation, betterment, blessing, and edification of his children will be restored again. Acts three twenty through 21 And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom ye have crucified, whom the heaven must receive unto the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Peter also taught that Jesus Christ would remain in heaven until the times of restitution of all things. Restitution means restoration. This prophecy began to be fulfilled in the spring of 1820, when God the Father and Jesus Christ appeared to Joseph Smith in the sacred grove. The times of restitution of all things refers to the restoration of the gospel which prepares the world for the millennium. The times of restitution of all things are when the restoration of the gospel takes place. That time includes the latter days, our days, and when Jesus Christ comes again. Restoration means to bring back or return. The restoration of the gospel began in the spring of 1820, when Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ appeared to the prophet Joseph Smith. That is when many things began to be brought back to the earth, including Jesus Christ, pure truce, priesthood authority, and church. Since ancient times, prophets have foretold 
that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, would come to earth and be our Savior. They also foretold that Jesus Christ would come a second time. And prophets also foretold that before the Savior comes again, he would restore his gospel and his church to the earth. The restoration that the prophets foretold is happening in our day. Acts three twenty-two through 23 For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Elder Bruce Armour Conkey said, At the second coming the vineyard shall be burned, and the wicked consumed. Acts 3.24 Gain all the prophets from Samuel, and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Elder Bruce Armour Conkey says, Peter and the other apostles had learned from the Lord as he ascended before them on the Mount of Olives that the restoration of the kingdom to Israel would take place at a future day, a day subsequent to New Testament times. Now the Holy Ghost, speaking by the mouth of Peter, reveals that not only Israel, but all things are to be restored in a day to come. This prophetic pronouncement puts in perspective the teachings and hopes of all the prophets, it opens the door to an understanding of their statements about the restoration of the gospel in latter days, the gathering of scattered Israel, the second coming, Messiah's millennial reign, and the return of the earth itself to its paradisiacal glory. Who are the children of the covenant? Acts three twenty-five through 26 Ye are the children of the prophets, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you, first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Elder Bruce McConkie said, Jesus told the Nephite kinsmen of these Jews almost the same thing spoken here by Peter. To these American Hebrews the resurrected Lord said, and behold, ye are the children of the prophets, and ye are of the house of Israel, and ye are of the covenant which the Father made with your fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed, the Father having raised me up unto you first, and sent me to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And this because ye are the children of the covenant, and after that ye were blessed, then fulfilled the father the covenant, which he made with Abraham, saying, In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed, unto the pouring out of the Holy Ghost through me upon the Gentiles, which blessing upon the Gentiles shall make them mighty above all, unto the scattering of my people, O house of Israel. Who then are the children of the covenant? According to the terms of the covenant which God made with Abraham, all of the literal seed of that great prophet are entitled to receive the gospel, the priesthood, and all the ordinances of salvation and exaltation. When any of these descendants do receive all of these things, they become the sons of Moses and of Aaron and the seed of Abraham and the church and kingdom and the elect of God. They are then children of the covenant, that is, they are inheritors of the fullness of the blessings appertaining to the new and everlasting covenant, which is the gospel. Ye are the children of the covenant, our Lord told the Nephites among whom he ministered, a distinction which the faithful saints of this dispensation also enjoy. Rebellious descendants of Abraham are not his children in the special sense that is intended by the designation children of the covenant. Those who follow in the footsteps of the prophets, who believe as they believed, and live as they lived, are the children of the prophets. They are children in the sense of being followers or disciples, and they may also be their literal seed. However, the rebellious literal seed cut themselves off from the blessings of their fathers, and they become the children of the devil rather than the children of the prophets. Christ came so that men could free themselves from their iniquities by accepting the terms and conditions of his atoning sacrifice. And this great blessing 
out of which salvation comes, was first for the children of the covenant, and thereafter to all the kindreds of, of the earth. For because of Christ, the Holy Ghost would be poured out upon the Gentiles also. You can see 64, 34 through 36. Behold, the Lord requireth the heart and a willing mind, and the, the willing and obedient shall eat the good of the land of Zion in these last days. And the rebellious shall be cut off out of the land of Zion, and shall be sent away, and shall not inherit the land. For verily I say that the rebellious are not of the blood of Ephraim. Wherefore, they shall be plucked out. It seems strange that the Lord would say that blood, a symbol for descendancy, could be influenced by rebelliousness, a spiritual trait. Isn't one either a descendant of Ephraim or not a descendant of Ephraim? The answer is no, not in the eyes of the Lord, who views his children in terms of their spiritual qualities. Paul taught this principle to the early saints. The Jews took great pride in the fact that they were of the circumcision, that is, that they were the covenant people, circumcision being the token of that covenant. But Paul pointed out that if one of the circumcision violated the law, his circumcision is made uncircumcision. In other words, by transgression, one excludes himself from being a true Israelite. Paul concluded his reasoning with this statement, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Nephi also understood this principle and taught, For behold, I say unto you, that as many of the Gentiles as will repent are the covenant people of the Lord, and as many of the Jews as will not repent shall be cast off. For the Lord covenanteth with none save it be with them that repent and believe in his Son, who is the Holy One of Israel. Ephraim received the birthright under the hands of Jacob, and was considered by the Lord to be Joseph's firstborn. President Joseph Fielding Smith explained why. It is essential in this dispensation that Ephraim stand in his place at the head, exercising the birthright in Israel, which was given to him by direct revelation. Therefore, Ephraim must be gathered first to prepare the way through the gospel and the priesthood for the rest of the tribes of Israel when the time comes for them to be gathered to Zion. The great majority of those who have come into the church are Ephraimites. It is the exception to find one of any other tribe unless it is of Manasseh. It is Ephraim today who holds the priesthood. It is with Ephraim that the Lord has made covenant and has revealed the fullness of the everlasting gospel. It is Ephraim who is building temples and performing the ordinances in them for both the living and for the dead. When the lost tribes come, and it will be the most wonderful sight and a marvelous thing when they do come to Zion. In fulfillment of the promises made through Isaiah and Jeremiah, they will have to receive the crowning blessings from their brother Ephraim, the firstborn, in Israel. An understanding of this mission of Ephraim helps us understand why the Lord would say that the rebellious are not of the blood of Ephraim.